Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Hello, listeners. You're tuned in to Apex Express on KPFA, bringing you an Asian and Asian American view from the Bay and around the world. This is Tracy Nguyen, and tonight we're bringing some amazing conversations from the internet to the radio. Welcome to Apex Express. I'm your host, Tracy Nguyen, and it is the year 2021. And something about this year feels nothing quite like a new year. The trauma we've experienced in the last year has completely been compounded and the effects of it are long lasting. We'll be seeing this very moment evolve for generations and generations to come. But last year, during the start of the pandemic, what I witnessed was that the internet blew up with incredible virtual conversations and our interconnectedness had skyrocketed because you know most people had to organize virtually and it was easier in many ways to connect with folks across the country and the world all with the touch of a button and I remember joining so many incredible webinars panels and events that were so timely but also so important for us to reiterate and dissect again and again. So tonight, I'm sharing a piece on the roots of racism, which was a title of a conversation amongst Asian American and Pacific Islander activists about cross-racial solidarity. This conversation literally took place two days before George Floyd's murder. So, you know, I can't stress enough about how much we end up having the same conversations over and over and over again. I mean, we just celebrated MLK Day last Monday, and so much of his quotes from the civil rights movement are relevant even today, 50 years later. So in the spirit of amplifying amazing, timeless conversations and lessons, I wanted to air this panel that I heard last year on tonight's show. Again, it's a virtual town hall called The Roots of Structural Racism, and it was hosted by the People's Collective for Justice and Liberation. The speakers you'll hear are Dr. Emilani Case, who's a native Hawaiian writer and teacher, Sarah Eagle Hart, who's part of Return to the Heart Foundation, Denari Grace, who's a blues singer, songwriter, and activist, Kipura Kurs from Life Camp, and Dr. Connie Wu from AAPI Women Lead. Aloha. My name is Emma Lani case. Um, And first of all, I would just like to say thank you to the organizers and um, and to everybody who's joining us today. Um, It's an honor to be asked uh, to come back and join in on another town hall and to engage in really important conversation with all of you. Um, Just in terms of framing and talking about some of the communities that I serve, um, I'm Kanaka Maoli. I'm Native Hawaiian And so first and foremost, the most immediate communities that I serve are those of Indigenous Hawaiians. Um, And when I say Indigenous Hawaiians, that extends beyond my human relations, that extends to the natural environment, our lands, our waters, our ocean ways, our skyscapes as well. Um, So most of my work deals with trying to expose the roots of structural racism so that we can work towards justice justice and liberation for our land, our water, our ocean, and our people. Um, I currently live and work in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and I teach Pacific Studies at Victoria University of Wellington. So other communities that I also 
work for or try to be in service to involve Pacific peoples and Pacific communities um, and on a broader scale, indigenous communities as well. Um, I think a lot of my current work and activism, um, whether through teaching or writing um, or actual activist work with communities, uh, focuses on issues of settler colonialism and militarism. Um, and kind of sits at the intersection of those things. And so I look at the long, long and ongoing legacies of colonialism, of structural racism, and how it has disadvantaged our peoples, Hawaiian people, Pacific people, indigenous people, um, and how it has led to a disregard and the destruction of our natural environments. Um, so I'm very, very excited to be here and to kind of locate some of the work that I do within these larger conversations um, with all of you in the hopes that we can build some very meaningful solidarities and work towards justice and liberation for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Eagleheart, can you go up next and tell us a little bit about what you'll be saying and how you're going to help us out today? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Betty Washte. Um, that means good day and Lakota. Um, I'm Ogallala Lakota. I was raised on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and I am CEO and co-founder of Return of the Heart Foundation, which focuses on um, uplifting opportunities for indigenous women-led initiatives around civic engagement, climate justice, um, economic development and narrative change. Um, the one few things that I, I would say that I want to, as a introduction to me really is that, you know, growing up in a rural tribal communities, I dreamt of ways to help my people while growing up in extreme poverty. Um, but at the time, you know, many of us, you know, when you're poor, you don't really realize that you were poor. I don't, I didn't realize that. Um, and, mostly because we are really rich in culture. And I, even though I had a lot of hardships, you know, not having a mother or father being able to take care of me when I was young, um, I was able to have extended family that stepped in to take care of me. So each step that I've taken in my life um, has really, I've had several layers of difficulty that I've had to get through and haven't had a road, a roadmap or a road, a role model to follow. But for me, it was really important to trust in Tinkashala, the great spirit, and to push past, you know, this discomforts. And so a lot of the way that I do my advocacy work is through storytelling. And it's really about wanting to see a difference in the lived experience of my home community, as well as other Native Americans in the United States. And one of this very important perspective for me is undoing the effects of the doctrine of discovery and manifest destiny, um, which means the inherent right to conquer and rule a people, which is what America was founded on, as well as many other countries as well. Um, and so undoing that propaganda and um, the pioneer sort of love stories about how America was really formed and beginning to infuse the stories of indigenous worldview, which is really about understanding our connection to nature, to space, um, how it is connected to thought and experience, and also understanding natural cycles such as seasons, harvesting cycles, moon patterns, etc., and living in harmony and balance. And so that's a lot of what I infuse through all of my storytelling and my advocacy, and I'm really happy to be here with you all. Thank you for having me. So thank you, Dr. Malani and Sarah, for these introductions. We... Um, have a, another speaker who has not yet joined us, but I think it would be really great um, if we began the conversation between the three of us um, with you two leading the way, if that is okay with you all. So a couple of things before we begin. At AAPI Women Lead, uh, we're an organization, you know, as folks mentioned earlier, we highlight the issues of violence that impact self-identified Asian and Pacific Islander women and girls. Now, one of the things that we've been working on is thinking through the concept of violence. 
we think through and we kind of expand our understanding of violence. So that while right now many people are emphasizing interpersonal forms of violence, right? Like hate violence. You see it all over social media. We at our organization, alongside with some of our colleagues and partners, including Dr. Dylan Rodriguez, some of the things that we think about is um, we talk about anti-Asian violence along the lines of racial health disparities. We think about the ways that our communities don't have access to health care. We think about the ways that our communities are being deported as a form of anti-Asian violence. We think about the colonial wars that many of our communities experienced that actually in, kind of ushered us here to these lands. The colonial wars as a type of anti-Asian violence. When we work with our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, we also consider our communities as survivors of colonial wars, colonial violence, climate violence. Um, so we've expanded all of this to help us better understand what anti-Asian violence is. That it's not just between me and you or him and her and they and them, right? But that it's also about structures and systems. Okay. Given this, we have also worked to um, understand, help people to understand that we see anti-Asian violence as made possible through anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity across the globe. So we've expanded the definition, pushed us to expand it, recognizing so many of us are survivors, and then we recognize that all of this has everything to do with anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity. On that note, can you all tell us some of your thoughts around what that means for the communities that you serve, um, that you represent, and those of whom you care about? And let's start with Sarah. Why don't we do that? Good to see your faces, by the way. Yeah, no, this is really exciting. I love um, being on Zoom with everybody. I love that we started out with music. That was really fun. Um, so I'm really enjoying being here. And, um, and also, I think it's important because I think that, you know, for Native Americans right now um, in the U.S., there is definitely sort of a disconnect between the media attention that is happening um, with some of the COVID outbreaks. Um, in some places, you know, there's a lot of attention, which is, you know, like Navajo Nation, which is definitely seeing an outbreak that's bigger than New York City, which is, you know, that needs to happen. Um, in other places like South Dakota, there are the beginnings of outbreaks that happening in a state that has been very hostile toward Native Americans and toward tribes um, and threatening tribal sovereignty. So for us, it's been um, really important to be able to share not only you know, the issues and struggles that Native Americans are facing as a whole, but also to be in solidarity with everyone else. And to be honest, a lot of my my professional career has been spent working with other diverse cultures and trying to um, build solidarity together because I really felt that that was the quickest, fastest way for us to see impact. Um, so for mm -hmm. us in the... In, and on our reservations, I mean, the reason why you're seeing a lot of the, the outbreaks happening is, number one, we do have a, a huge health disparities for our communities with um, different diseases around diabetes or immunocompromised systems. Um, we're also dealing with communities that have housing shortages and multi-families -fam living in one community. Um, and then you might be living in a state where there has been no stay in place order that's been um, announced or, or anything. And, and so for us, like there's this, <laughs> the most vulnerable of the vulnerable are at risk for death. And I mean, it's just, it's a fact. And when you have racism that's compounding that, um, you be begin to feel very much under attack, that your people are under attack and that there is no care or regard for the health and safety of your communities. Um, so I know that there has, has been a lot of, you know, additional concern because in Navajo Nation, just yesterday, a friend of mine um, 
Ali Young, who has been working around Protect the Sacred, which has been primarily focused on supporting the mental health um, of the young people on Navajo Nation, had posted a photo of these um, people that, you know, they changed the Navajo flag into a swastika and were not obeying or trying to... um, you know, enforce any of the dis- social distancing um, norms or rules on purpose. <laughs> and so when you think about that, that's outwardly happening to your community, it's it's very, very scary um, to think that it's bl- so blatant that it's just outrageous. Um, and then in South Dakota, places like South Dakota, where, you know, the access to health care has been also impacted, um, our health care is a treaty right. Um, it was an exchange for the land and resources that were forcibly taken from us. And that um, Indian Health Services has never been fully funded. So because it's been never fully funded, we've never had reliable um, health care systems. Um, so because of that, and because of our reliance on the federal system, where Native people have not been the priority for getting things like personal protective equipment, it's just compounded the level of um, racism and disparity that our communities are facing right now in this moment and having to deal with that. So for me, a lot of this also does go back historically because none of this is new, right? This has been happening for generations and generations. And one of the issues is that most people don't really understand the history of how America was even founded and how a lot of the pioneering stories that we have of like Little House on the Prairie or, um, you know, these songs that we have, like, um, you know, this is my land, this is your land, you know, from, and so for me, like, it's undoing all of this propaganda that we have, many people have grown up loving, right? <laughs> and, and so that can be really hard for some people to sort of take a step back and say, oh, I have to undo my thought process around what that meant um, around holding land and, and space and what that means for Native Americans in this moment. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> These are really important points um, that I'm hoping Dr. I know Dr. Malani will address. And I, I, I kind of wanted to emphasize something and you're helping me to think through the ways that, you know, there's this idea about the American dream that so many of our Asian communities, immigrant communities aspire to. And when you say this is your land, my land, whatever that song is, I don't even probably, I did a really good job for getting it. So... <laughs> I think through that, right? Like the American dream and then my land, your land for getting like kind of uh, coerced to forget that this is someone else's land that we are on, right? So thank you for all of these um, reminders um, about the history as well as the current moment of crisis that um, Indigenous communities have been living under still. Thank you, Dr. Malani. Wow, thank you. Um, Thank you first for the question, Connie, and then Sarah for your response. There's just so much to to unpack and so much to add to. Um, I think, you know, when we talk about anti-Asian violence, anti-Blackness, anti-Indigeneity, I'd like to just link to something Sarah mentioned in her intro, which is the doctrine of discovery. I think they all link to the assumption of white supremacy and the dehumanization of people that came with that doctrine. Um, And in regards to the Pacific and to Hawaii, those assumptions, that assumption of of white supremacy came aboard European ships and was brought by European sailors. Um, Captain James Cook was one of them. And last year here in Aotearoa, there was a little bit of a debate about whether or not Captain James Cook was a white supremacist. But if you look at his actions, If you look at what he was armed with when he came into the Pacific, he very much was someone who came in assuming that the indigenous people he would come into contact with were less than human. Um, And that was um, reinforced by this doctrine, by this very racist doctrine, which basically allowed for the violent raid and seizure 
of lands. Um, and so the doctrine of discovery impacted Native Americans and impacted people in the Pacific as well. Um, Captain Cook had aboard his ship in his second voyage to the Pacific, a naturalist um, named Johann Forrester, who created a, he called it like his, his variations of humanity or, or a, you know, a gradation of human variation in the Pacific, where Pacific peoples ranked lower than the low. We were less than human. And if you can dehumanize people, then you can justify your conquering of them. And that happened in the Pacific, that happened um, in, uh, on Native American land as well. If you're not human, then you can't even be seen as someone who occupies land as a human being. Um, you're just reduced down to this being that breathes. You're some sort of breathing meat and you're not a person that is worthy of safety and security. Um, and so, you know, if we talk about the roots of structural racism, they go very, they go far back. And that dehumanization of people continues to this day. And we can see it manifested in everything from the ongoing militarization of my lands, the fact that Hawaii's lands and waters are still seen as a place that are, um, a place that is suitable for military training, for nuclear bombing, um, places in the Pacific like Marshall, like the Marshall Islands and Guahan or Guam are still seen as places that are only valuable for how they can be used and abused by the United States. And that relies upon the assumption of white supremacy and the dehumanization of indigenous peoples. And we can, we can see that right now in the time of COVID-19, um, a lot of my recent or a lot of my my energy and time lately has been going into trying to put an end to RIMPAC, um, R-I-M-P-A-C, which is the international maritime war exercise that happens in Hawaii every two years. And in the time of COVID-19, we're having to fight to put an end to RIMPAC. Um, because we don't think it's appropriate to have thousands of soldiers converging in our Hawaiian lands and on our Hawaiian, in our Hawaiian waters during a global pandemic. Um, but the fact that we even have to argue for our safety and for our security means that our lives are not deemed as, um, as worthy or as important as other people's lives. Um, we can even see this in climate change. The fact that people are willing to look at islands like Kiribati and like Tuvalu and say, well, it's happening there. Your islands are drowning, um, but we'll wait and see what happens to you and then we'll take action. It reinforces this idea that our lands and our peoples, again, are expendable, that we're able to be used as sacrifice zones for the so-called betterment of, of all, even though we're not included in that all. And to link to something you said earlier, Connie, about the American dream, the American dream really only extends so far. The American dream is a dream that is based upon and dependent on squashing certain people, dehumanizing certain people. We know the American nation was founded upon slavery and it was founded upon the, the genocide of Native Americans. It was founded upon the militarization and the dehumanization of people in the Pacific as well, who don't often even come into the conversation. So I think, you know, just linking back to the question of, of anti-Asian violence, anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity, anti they have these deep, deep roots um, that are, are based in white supremacy. And, and they manifest in everything from militarism to the fact that our people, Pacific Islanders and, and Native Hawaiians have higher rates of infection in the time of COVID-19 because of gross economic um, disparities, because we are more likely to um, be poor, we're more likely to be homeless, we're more likely to be incarcerated um, in our homelands, in Hawaii and in our islands in the Pacific and also um, in the continental U.S. So I just tried to hopefully bring some bridges between things that were said, but um, yeah, maybe I'll just, I'll end it there. If I could jump in really quick, Connie, is that okay? Um, I, I wanted to also wrap back around on the doctrine of discovery because for many people, this might be very new. This is the first time you've heard anyone talk about doctrine of discovery. 
um, in a previous <laughs> life as well. I was on the staff of the presiding bishop, Catherine Jeffert Shorey, who was the first female presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. And uh, while I was on the staff, um, very new, like you, literally like a couple months into my job, I was a, a team leader for diversity, social justice, environmental justice. And again, this was a thing where it wasn't a place I expected myself to be, but the creator had other plans for me. And so I ended up working um, internationally on the staff of the presiding bishop. And she was the, the church was the first church to repudiate the doctrine of discovery back in 2009, which then led to the World Council of Churches also repudiating the doctrine of discovery in 2012. So I, I say this because while it was lovely that they repudiated the doctrine of discovery, I'm still waiting to see action follow that those words of repudiation of the doctrine of discovery. So that means, you know, where's the equity that follows saying, yes, we were wrong. We were wrong to found America and all of these other countries under this doctrine that dehumanize people. Um, and so there's still a lot of like disconnect between how do you actually do that, right? And for me, it really is about having equal access to opportunities and having equal access um, even in places like the media. Because if you don't have media, then you don't really have anything because you don't exist. Um, I'm also thinking, so thank you for both of the contexts, um, both here and the other lands that have been occupied and colonized and, and occupied. I'm um, thinking about, again, you know, for many of our communities who are quote unquote, like immigrants here um, on, on stolen land, I think about, you know, our responses to the anti-Asian climate right now, which is that we, um, we, d we deserve the right to be on this land. You know, is one of our responses to say the administration's um, depiction of this as the Chinese virus and everyone responding um, xenophobically. Like, you know, they don't belong here, right? And so our response, not m mine, but some of the <laughs> some people's responses have been, "We belong here," right? And so I think having us um, hear about the context by which this land is not ours right, um, is an important one. And the, the, for us to hear that what it takes, what it took, what it continues to take for this land to be occupied, it means the dehumanization, it means the absence, it means the neglect, it means the death, um, the suffering of other, of indigenous communities. Um, for us to say we belong to this nation, right, means that we, uh, unconsciously and uncritically, means we're further occupying uncritically, right? And we're staking these claims, right? There is a danger in, um, in uh, replicating that history. I hope that that makes sense. And I'm, I'm hearing that. Um, I also, you know, um, understand and hear that, um, you know, Sarah, for instance, you talked about historically working with other communities. I wanted us to kind of, you know, we're still hopefully having some of our other speakers come on board, but I wonder what does that mean? Given everything that we've said, how does it shape our relationship to one another within this, um, we can even say historically or current context. What's that mean for all of us from your perspective? Well, for me, I, I mean, a couple of things like I, I think that it takes work to organize and to understand each other's issues. Right. Because um, all of in the time of this pandemic right now, you know, we're understanding, you know, how this is affecting each community. But we might not be able or have the time to dig into um, into it because we're also dealing with crisis 
every single ethnic community has been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And so I think it's even, we have to work even harder in order to organize and to understand each other's issues because we're being called into all of these different spaces. I, for me personally, I'm, I'm raising money to get personal protective equipment to my communities because I don't want them to die. <laughs> and, and so, and so that's a very like heavy, heavy burden to have, you know, for me, like it has kept me up um, as well, just worried, you know, are, are our communities going to get the basic necessities that they need in order to fight the pandemic? Mm-hmm. Um, and so you also have to, on top of that, you know, make time for other, you know, calls and make sure that, you know, thankfully like Revolve Impact has been a really great space where I've been able to meet everybody here on this panel and, you know, Mike helped organize us and we were already in relationship. Um, But that's taken time for us to commit to being on a call each week to understand each other's issues, but also if we needed to organize um, around funding, um, which we have actually, <laughs> to um, to call in philanthropy to fund our communities and the grassroots communities equitably um, with an article called The Message from the Grassroots, which is asking for um, support for additional funding and asking for philanthropy to also include us in their planning processes as well, um, has been very transformative, but it's also taken a lot of intention time. And so I'm just really grateful when people do that because I know that we don't always have that time and we're having to carve it out really intentionally. Before we bring on our third guest, I want to make sure that folks hear what Sarah is saying is that we have been working collectively off, you know, off screen (laughs) <laughs> off Zoom to support one another in trying to figure out ways to raise funds to support all of our communities um, and to reshape how people are um, get, um, accessing resources, right? So I think that's important. We've been working collectively. So on that note, I'm going to pause for a second so that we can bring on our speaker. I like how everyone is supporting and holding space, all 173 of you. Thank you. It looks like we actually have another guest. Oh my God, this is like a big party. So we have two other individuals that are coming on. Um, Good thing that I'm good at multitasking, friends. So it looks like we have Miss Kiris is on. on. Um, And then we have... Duna Ray, both guests have joined us. And please, me if I've said uh, <laughs> differently. So I, w- I, I would love for you both to um, chime in. Actually, Denari, am I saying Denari? Denari, drums with Canary. Denari, Grace. <laughs> Denari, can you tell us a little bit about who you are um, so that our folks can learn from you, please? Yes, hi. Oh. Um, uh, my name is Daenery Grace. I and you will ignore my dog, please. Um, I am based in New York, born and raised New Yorker, um, Lenape land. Um, I am a blues singer, songwriter, uh, a poet, um, an essayist, um, and um, I'm also a regular um, public speaker educator um, in, a, in a non-traditional sense, um, an activist. Um, and like I said, I'm based here in New York, um, on Long Island, and I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I was not expecting this, um, but I'm very happy to join in and, and join this session. So thank you for inviting me and having me. Thank you. Um, and then, Ms. Kirsten, can I see you being busy. I feel like it might be a cooking show. And no, no, it's not. I'm actually ready whenever you are. And forgive me, um, like you, I'm in and out of spaces, but I'm fully present now. You can do anything you'd like. Can you share with us <laughs> about who you are? Yeah. 
So my name is Kepra, Kepra Kears. I am the Director of Wellness and Therapeutic Services at Life Camp. I work with Erica Ford, and we work in New York City and throughout the country in helping people heal from the trauma of uh, the pain of violence, systemic racism, you know, which contributes to poverty and disease. And I'm here today to just offer a moment of a healing circle. And I love that you said it looks like a cooking show. When I was trying to think about where I would host a healing circle, we're in COVID, we're in transition, and I wanted to create a space of love and beauty in the best way that I could. And so the kitchen is my healing circle. The kitchen is where I do all of my healing in the way of food, in the way of gratitude. And so when I bring people into my kitchen, it's actually a space of healing. And so what I pride myself in, well, pride is probably not the good. What I give gratitude for is that in the work that we do, we provide unconventional therapeutic wellness for black and brown communities impacted by trauma. And for a lot of us, it looks like healing through food, bringing someone into your home. And so that's what I wanted to create, a non-denominational, multiracial space, and that is the kitchen. And so welcome to this healing space where you should feel welcome because there is love in my heart. There is light in the space. There is light in my body. And I wanted to offer the opportunity to bring some healing to this very dynamic, very heavy conversation. I want you all to just take a moment to check in and feel your face. I want you to smile. Just everyone smile. Just keep smiling. And I want you to be present to the fact that for some of you, it feels weird. Be present to the conversation like, I don't want to smile. Be present to how the muscles are actually pushing down and resisting. And if that's happening for you, that's because of all of the years or the hours or the days or the weeks or the months. I just heard the sister say, I can barely get enough supplies for my people. And then I have to do this and that. And what happens is we're all doing so much that we're not even present to the gift of life. Mm -hmm. And so we were all born with the energy of love and a sound mind. And for us to do this work, we have to tap into that love. We have to tap into that light within us in order to be. And so that's why I brought us into the kitchen, because that's the space where I get to be my and express the true love that I have. So if you feel me, I would like to continue in my kitchen healing space. (laughs) May I continue? So first and foremost, um, because we have people from all walks of life who've been impacted by systemic racism, it would probably take me a long time to give homage and praise. And I may even mess up if I try to give greetings from every cultural tradition. So what I'm going to do is just pour a libation to all of our ancestors, giving thanks to the collective consciousness that is us, black, brown, yellow, red, white, all of us who've come together in the name of healing in our community. And so a small libation, I give thanks for all of our ancestors, for all of those who came before us in order for us to be here today together. So ashe, namaste. A whole, um, and again, I won't continue because I'm sure I'm going to leave someone out, but please know that that is just my greeting of saying, give thanks, welcome, and I send nothing but love, and the love that I see in you is also reflected in my heart. What I want us to do is take a moment to think about, as we do this work, the one thing that connects us and the root of systemic racism comes from the fact that many people have forgotten who we are who we are. And so the one thing that we all have in common, the one thing that we all need, the one thing that without it, none of us would be here regardless to race, class, or gender, is the breath. The breath right now is activating and serving all of us in all of our different states, physically, geographically, even in our states of mind. The breath is the one thing that serves us without even asking. The breath is the one thing that serves us when we give no gratitude or homage. The breath is everywhere at the same time. And therefore, the breath is omnipresent. And because without the breath, there is no life. The breath is also omnipotent, all-powerful. And because the breath is the thing that we need when we're running and we're serving and we're doing and we take it in to receive clarity, the breath is also omniscient. And so when I think about a force that gives life to all, that is everywhere at the same time, that helps us tap into the all-knowing. I think of God. 
And what I recognize is that there is God or a supreme force in all of us that has no beginning and no end. And there's the one thing that connects all of us that is undeniable. And so it's no accident that here comes a virus to attack the breath. And no matter how much money, no matter what status we've decided based on ego separation, no matter what it is, we are all impacted. And so this virus has also humbled us and helped us to recognize that we are all one. We are all connected. And it serves us particularly as people of color, as people from the diaspora, as people of these amazing continents to come together under one breath under one consciousness so that we can tap into the supreme intelligence that our ancestors were able to tap into that helped to build pyramids, that helped to create science and medicine, that helped to cultivate the land to bring forth fruits and life. And so I'm going to invite everyone in the moment to just let's come together and be honored, pay homage to the breath that is in all of us. You can close your eyes. Or you can find a space wherever you are and just kind of stare off into the distance. Don't bring it into focus. It's what's called soft eyes. When it's a little blurry, so you can keep soft eyes or you can close your eyes. And so in that state, I just want you to relax. I want you to just be present to the fact that you're breathing. Most of us, just like with our posture, we're not even aware we're not sitting up straight. I want you to be present to the breath, to the gift that keeps on giving. I want you to notice how it's cool coming in through the nose and it's warm going out of the nose. And just continue to notice that, how the ebb and flow of the breath is cool coming in and warm going out. And just notice that. And notice whatever conversation might be going on in your head. If there's any chatter, like, what is this? If there's any judgment, if there's any critique or control, let it go. That's the ego separating you from your divine self in this moment. Give yourself this moment. Give yourself the moment of silence. And so experience the breath coming in. Experience the breath going out. And as you do, I want you to take your hands and place them gently on your belly. And as you have your hands resting on your belly, and you're breathing in and out. I want you to notice that when you breathe in, the belly expands and fills up with air. And when you breathe out, the belly contracts and releases. And just notice that. Don't do anything extra. Just breathe in, feel the coolness. Breathe out, feel the warmth. Breathe in, feel the belly rise. Breathe out, feel the belly contract. And just continue to do that and notice the breath. The breath has been that faithful, humble servant that even when you're not noticing or paying attention to it, it continues to serve. And how many of us serve tirelessly and selflessly without any acknowledgement or notice? So you can relate to the breath. And now as you're breathing in and out, I want you to experience white light. I want you to see clear white light as you breathe in. And when you breathe in, see that clear white light coming through the nostrils, up through the sinuses, into the head, and going down all the way through the body into the feet. And so you see the white light coming in, going up to the crown, going all the way down to the feet. And continue to breathe in clear white light and see it coming in and going to the crown and filling the body. And now that the white light has come from from throughout into the nose, up to the crown and down to the feet, I want you to be present to your feet. I want you to wiggle your toes and I want you to see the light coming through your toes into your feet. Breathe the breath of life into the feet and give thanks for the breath that keeps the blood flowing through the feet so we can walk this walk for our people. Give thanks for the ability to stand tall for our people because the breath of life is flowing through the blood through our feet so that we can stand and walk and be present. And continue to breathe in and breathe that breath of light and that white light up through the shins and into the calf. And let's give thanks for the calves that hold up the body, these little calves that allow us to continue to move and stand firm. 
and continue to breathe in and breathe that white light up into the knees and give thanks to the knees that allow us to go from take one step at a time. That our steps may be ordered that we move with grace and continue to breathe in and let the white light fill our thighs and our seat, our crown. And let us be reminded that we are the descendants of royalty, of the great ones who've come before us, who've lived and who died and who fought with courage so that we could be. And may we always sit on our throne. And may we remember that the fight is not ours to fight. We just must hold the light and sit on our throne and be royal and graceful in our movements. And let's give thanks for the thighs that also hold us up and serve us well. And as we continue to breathe, breathe in through the digestive system, through the belly, through our root chakra, continue to just breathe in and give thanks for our womb, our creative center. Give thanks for our reproductive organs that we may bring forth life. And whether it is life biologically or life in creativity, give thanks and praise for the light in our midst. And for our immune system that lives in the gut, may it be fortified with light so we continue to stay strong as we move forward on this journey of healing. And continue to breathe in and up into the lungs and breathe light and life into the lungs and see white light filling the lungs as, as long as much as the air is coming through and breathe and give thanks that we can breathe on our own without a respirator. Give thanks for the breath. Give thanks for the breath that keeps us all together. Give thanks for the one thing we should be fighting for, which is the right to breathe. Give thanks and praise for the light and the breath in our lungs. And breathe that breath of life and that light into the heart. And take your hands and gently put them on your heart. And breathe light into your heart. Bring love to the places that hurt. Bring love and light to the places that hurt. And may we let go of the intergenerational pain that is embedded in our DNA, that is in our skin, that is in our cells. May we release all of the pain that we carry in our hearts that prevents us from being clear, that prevents us from not acting without emotion. May we be blessed to be light at heart so that as we take on these amazing, phenomenal journeys. We can do it with lightness and with joy no matter what the task. And continue to breathe light up through the throat and give thanks for the throat, for our voice, that we can speak on behalf of our people, that we can speak up for ourselves, that we can articulate words and legislation and power to our communities, that we can speak words of healing. And be mindful of the times that we were not reverent of the breath and how we abuse the breath with our words. And may we be forgiven for the times that we may have soiled the breath with words that did not heal or soothe or love. And continue to breathe in the light of love and life and light on the face and fill your face with light and smile because we are here. We are here. And allow the light to fill the face and be mindful of any conversation that is stopping you from filling your face with light. And just lift the cheeks, lift the cheeks. Think of it as a muscle exercise, lift those cheeks. And think about the fact that we are here to bring light to one another. We were not born with mirrors. So our only vision of ourselves is in the reflection of one another. And may we be light in our face. May we bring love and radiate love every time we show up. So that we can heal just by our presence and continue to breathe the light of love and life into the crown, into the crown. And may our portal be open that we receive and tap into the supreme intelligence that is available for all of us. So we are all one. We are all of the same breath and of the same mind. Take a deep breath. Feel the warmth. As, it, as you exhale, feel the coolness as you inhale. And give yourself a moment of silence. Breathing in, drinking in the air, exhaling, breathing out all the stress and the hurt. Just let it go. 
Just let it go. Let it go so the mind can be clear, so you can know what to do next. So that we're not moving to and fro with stress, but we are divinely guided because we are in alignment. We are in tune. It is our birthright. We are powerful beyond measure. And that is why we are feared. And then we have compassion for all of the human race, for all of the members of the human race who are disconnected from the breath and forget who they are and who we are. And give thanks that we come from such a divine legacy of great ones. And may we honor that legacy with grace, with breath, I know that every opportunity to take a breath is another opportunity to live. For we know not when our last breath will be. And so we give thanks. And now, whenever you're ready, just wiggle your fingers and your toes to bring yourself back into the moment and ground yourself. And slowly open your eyes or bring your vision back into clarity. I want to thank you for allowing me the space to share. I pray that my words and my presence was a reflection of your own light. I am just a vessel. I am here to serve. I am here to remind you of who you are. I am grateful for each and every one of you for standing up for me and my children and for the ancestors and for our communities But please remember, when there is resistance within yourself, you cannot fight. You have to be clear. Tap into the wisdom so that it's easier. It's not easy, but it should be easier. You should flow. And so take some time. Inhale some essential oil. Lavender is good. Activate the oils. Inhale and get your healing before you even take on your journey because this is a heavy journey. And so you must be fortified. Keep water in the body. Keep light in your heart. Keep good food in the body. And thank you. Thank you to all of you for allowing the opportunity to hear. May you be blessed beyond measure. Thank you so much. Tracy, and you're tuned in to Apex Express on 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 
and K248BR in Santa Cruz. And always online at kpfa.org. I hope you all enjoyed that beautiful town hall. You can find a whole series of these amazing conversations from elections and electoral justice to youth organizing, disability justice and gender justice. These all these conversations are held by the People's Collective for Liberation and Justice and they have a lot of amazing things to offer. They are a pro-justice movement of Asians and Asian Americans building transformative solidarity with Black, Indigenous, and people of color and organizing with an intersectional, multi-generational, and cross-sector framework. You can find them online at People's Collective for JL.org. That's People's Collective, the number four, numerical four, J l.org all right and for all you listeners out there keep resisting keep organizing keep creating and sharing your visions with the world your voices are important apex express is produced by tracy nguyen preeti mangala shakar tara darabji jessica antonio miko lee and jelena kiani lee and tonight's show was produced by your host, Tracy Nguyen. Special thanks to the crew at KPFA for their support during the shelter-in-place time. And Daniel Lamb, our sound engineer. Have a good night. Thank you. event for May 2021. If you're a tenant in San Francisco who can't pay rent, there are laws that can protect you, but they are not automatic. For assistance, call the San Francisco Anti-Displacement Coalition at 415-713-8634 or visit them online at sfadc.org. This community announcement is produced by the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Please send your listing for consideration to KPFA at 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way, Berkeley 94704, or email calendar at kpfa.org. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621, or view it online at kpfa.org. Wake up Friday mornings on KPFA with Rising Up with Sonali at 5 a.m. Then at 6 a.m., it's the first hour of Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. At 7 a.m., Upfront delivers a mix of local, state, and international coverage through challenging interviews, civil debates, breaking updates, and more, hosted by Janine Etter. 
Then, at 8 a.m., it's a weekly update on climate change and its effects on a local, national, and international level on A Rude Awakening, hosted by Sabrina Jacobs. At 9 a.m., it's the second hour of Democracy Now!, followed at 10 a.m. with Economic Update with radical economist Richard Wolff. Then we take a look at political and social issues in the Bay Area and beyond on El Show with Andre Soto. That's Friday mornings on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24 APR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfb.org.